Well, happy Sabbath, everybody. Um, Hey, if Fabian back there was laughing at me because I'm kind of like a social butterfly on speed or something. I'm not all nervous and I'm just moving around. <laughs> just need to calm down, I guess. What a bunch of beautiful faces that I see here today. And you know, um, uh, Maria and Francis and Juan, you know, as Sister Lori said, you are visitors only once. Okay, just once, <laughs> and that time is done. You're now family, so welcome home. Uh, we hope to see you more often. Uh, just met one, and I'm, I'm such a big liar. I, don't know, I told you I wasn't going to say anything about this. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, just as I think, you know, my heartache ends, another heartbreak happens. You know, we lost. Uh, well, I don't want to say we lost, but. Uh, we gifted Pastor Q and Elizabeth to another congregation, and now I'm losing some very dear friends, Ben and Carol. I don't want to say I'm losing you all, but I just always look forward to seeing you every single week. And, yeah. Come back. Come back soon, please. You know. But God bless you, and uh, thank you for being a part of us here, and um, just as I've said with pastor i'm going to say the same thing with you we're gifting you to another congregation so that you can bless them as you blessed us Amen. okay thank you for everything let's bow our heads heavenly father bless this message today almighty father open our hearts open our minds so that we re we may receive you and, 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 and put it to good use almighty father in our hearts so that it glorifies you and that it edifies others towards you. That's for your will. And this we pray in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. So I can honestly say that uh, you know, I've got some pretty good kids. I've got three children. They're pretty good. Pretty good kids. You know, they've got their issues. They've got their, <laughs> their troubles. Um, but, you know, what kids don't? I do find it interesting, though, when I try to give them some uh, scolding, admonition, maybe sometimes, sometimes what they believe to be unpopular uh, advice, I always love what they respond to me. They always say something like, um, Dad, you know, you don't really understand, or, you know, occasionally, well, what's the big deal? <laughs> My personal favorite. Dad, times are different. People are different. I sit back and I say to myself, yeah, I guess so, you know. Me and your mom, you know, we grew up, when we were growing up, there was no worldly, secular-driven agendas or anything deciding our, our motives back then. There was no provocative influences or anything like that, right? <laughs> well, I grew up in the 70s and the 80s. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I understand the 60s were probably something different. And I didn't mean to single you out, I'm just saying. <laughs> You see, when I was growing up, our literature, movies, music, entertainment, society in general, was geared towards secularism. And let me tell you something. Unholy agendas were just, I mean, they were, they were how can I say this, they were ripe with fever. To inundate every single aspect of our lives, every fold, there was some sort of God, ungodly agenda. But I do understand what my kids are trying to tell me. You know, times are different. I think I used to tell my parents the very same thing. They grew up in the 30s and 40s, you know, world wars, worldwide famines, depressions, you know, little things like that. But I ask you a question. Is the world that much different than 10 years ago? How about 25 years ago? Those of us who remember pre-9-11, I remember the very night before it happened and how life changed in an instant. How about a hundred years ago? A thousand? How about two thousand years ago when God himself had to send his beloved son for the filth that this world had become? Even after events like the flood and Sodom and Gomorrah, you'd think that mankind would learn its lesson. But we don't. We simply don't. So you know what? The world, kids, yeah, it does change. People do change. Two things done. God our Heavenly Father. Amen. And evil. Evil doesn't change. 
in the Garden of Eden, Job's homeland, Noah, Abraham, Moses, Egypt. I could go on and on and on. Evil just finds a better, more quicker, more efficient way to secure its stronghold within our lives. So, you know, I remember back in the day, as a young man, my personal influencer, I think that's what they call it nowadays, influencers, my personal influencer was music in general. Without a doubt, music. And really the fashion that it brought about. I, I love rock. I love rock and roll music. I just really did. I mean, I'm not combining it. The louder, the better. I was not immune to the influence that this brought into my life. You see, the type of music that I was infatuated with promoted a heavy imagery of nonconformity. It was very anti-government, very anti-society, and unfortunately very anti-God. I would comb my hair a certain way, I would dress a certain way, talk a certain way, and I would wear jewelry that was intended to intimidate others. I did all of this in a time in my life where I was attempting to establish an identity for myself. And so I thought, what better way to shock people in society, especially my family and loved ones, than to rebel against them? Oddly enough, though, I was very much what people nowadays would call a, a nerd. I don't know if that's offensive, but I really was. I loved school. I loved to read. I'd love to learn. I, I actually had pretty good grades. I'm not trying to, but, but I did. I was very studious, and I just loved learning. I still do. So there I was, living a very confused life. Brothers and sisters, I was groomed to be one thing when I was a child, from kinder to college. I was given a private education. I thank and I love my parents for doing so. But I was groomed and I was being molded into a Catholic priest. I'm not here to talk poorly about anything else about that. But that's what I was groomed for. We all see how that turned out. Didn't quite complete that. And at the time, in the midst of this rebellion, I didn't know it, but I, I, I also loved to learn more about God. Amen. I was not aware that he had any other plans for me, but there I was. So guess what? I experimented in activities that are contrary to God's will. I included music that would help justify my desire to identify with something, you know, with anything that would help me bring me purpose. I included fashion that promoted a style that would help me define my place in society. Again, I was not aware that God had other plans for me. He was patient with me. You're going to hear me say that over and over and over again. But a, what a blessing, and I didn't even know it. Now, what I did know was that I was rebelling against something that I had been taught all of my life. That was about the character of God. And I just, I didn't understand it at that time. What I did know, though, was that I was confused. I could not grasp the thought that in order to become a new creature in Christ, I must bury my present filth and accept His way as the only way. There's no gray areas here. I truly, brothers and sisters, believed that was perfectly acceptable. Why? Because I had tomorrow. I always had tomorrow. And I believed that it was perfectly acceptable to live in this, this, this lukewarm bath of my iniquities. You know, somewhere between the will of God and the will of Gus. I really, really thought that was a good thing. I was a good guy, after all, right? I remember I would clean myself up Monday through Fridays, go to school, private school, church on Sundays, learn about God. And in my free time, I'd let my hair down. Really, I had longer hair. You can ask my wife. <laughs> let my hair down, rebel against what I had just learned. Just absolute confusion. I had mentioned, along with this desire to have this music and this rebellion, fashion was very important to me as well. You see, how could I hang around my buddies partying and listening to the music that I was listening to and not also look like them? Back in the 80s, you know, I had my skin-tight jeans that were ripped, black concert shirts, jean jackets, diaper boots, jewelry. I remember the jewelry. We're going to talk about that shortly. 
I would wear these outfits, not because I made them look good, but because I felt they made me look good. They helped me fit in. Wow, one of my favorite pieces of jewelry was this thick silver ring that was shaped like a skull. It had a skull on it. And actually, I found a picture of it, and I was going to buy it. I mean, you wouldn't even believe that was me, but I had this big ring, and it had a skull on it. It was rather large, too. And I remember it stuck out. At this time, I liked these rings because it, it brought out what I believed to be the essence of my rebellion. You see, the skull typically represents death, and my intent was to shock. Not to harm, necessarily, see, but that's what I thought back then, just to shock. And what better way was there for others to remember my intent than to remember it with a skull? So as I look back now, I understand that the reality that I was experiencing at that point was that I was trying my darnest to represent death. You know, most people are afraid of death. So, this was a perfect fit. But you know what an awesome God would have? He is life, he is love, he is faithful, and he is forgiving. And I said I was going to say this over and over again, and I'm going to start now. What a blessing for me, for all of us, that he is also patient. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I'm going to ask you to turn, this is the New King James Version Bible, to Luke 23, Luke 23. 33. People ask me sometimes, why don't I bring a Bible up here to preach? And why do I print it out? <laughs> Guys, my, my, my vision, I need to get new glasses, but I can't read that small. And if I look up, I get dizzy. <laughs> so, <laughs> I did that. But new King James Version. Luke 23, verse 33. I hear people wrestling. Almost, are we there? All right. Luke 23, 33 says, And when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him. And the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left, and the other on the left. Two criminals. Now, depending on the Bible version that you're reading, Calvary might be used differently. And really, other than the other terms that are used to describe this hill's the hill on which Jesus was crucified, where he took place, the word Calvary is really only found in one place in the Bible. In this account, Luke 23, 33. So then Calvary, the word Calvary, Galvario in Spanish, it has its origins in several places. Now, before I tell you some of this, this is where I kind of get a little nervous sometimes when I, when I bring up these types of biblical tidbits, only because I've had in the past people come up and tell me, hey, you know what, you mispronounced it, or the footnote says this, or this and that. I, the, and I worry sometimes that we get stuck right there and we don't hear the rest of the message. So please forgive me if I mispronounce it, I'm gonna do my best. But the Greek term given at this point was kranu. In the, in the language that was spoken by the Hebrews, Aramaic, the name was Golgotha. Gulga, I promise you I practiced this over and I forget. The name was Golgotha, which transliterates, not translates, but transliterates directly into Greek as Golgotha, related to the Old Testament Hebrew word Golgoth. Now in the Roman language, Latin, the rulers of the time, it was Calvaria from which Calvary, Calvario or Calvary is derived. Now, brothers and sisters, all five words, Cranio, Golgotha, Golgotha, Golgolith, and Calvario, all mean Calavera. How many Spanish speakers here? What does it mean? Skull. There you go. Skull. <laughs> when we read in chapter 23 in the book of Luke, it refers to the skull-like hill on which Jesus was crucified. They also use the word in the other Gospels is called Gotha. You find that term there. You see, brothers and sisters, bring it back to my youth. Those skull rings, I intended to impress upon others the image of intimidation, an image of fear. Little did I know that even if I did achieve this message, it would be a temporary message. I mean, those who knew me back then would probably hardly remember them. I, in only preparing today, did I barely remember them. Matter of fact, I'm wondering whatever happened to them. I guess I just must have grew up and took them off my fingers one day and 
Never put him back on. Blessed is Jesus. Anyways, it was a temporary image for a temporary message of intimidation. My human mind could not achieve the purpose of leaving an everlasting message, brothers and sisters. I just couldn't come to that at, the, at that time. But God, God, however, he knows better than us. He knows us better than we know ourselves. He understands how to deliver a message. First, he understands the message and how to deliver it to you. He knows how to give just the right message for just the right moment for just the right purpose. He also understands how the human mind works and therefore understands just how to deliver this message so that it sticks in our memories as an everlasting testament to his will. The problem is our human minds choose to overlook or simply ignore these godly messages. See, the problem doesn't lie in the delivery of the message or in the delivery of these messages. He knows how to do that with perfection. The problem lies with our human frailty in recalling these messages, or at least forgetting the message when it's convenient for us to do so. I am a victim of that. Yeah, I should say I'm a victim of that. I commit those crimes on my own. But God, he delivers these messages. He delivers them profoundly and perfectly. So then, why Calvary? Why Calvary, brothers and sisters, why? Why was the place of the skull chosen for the perfect sacrifice? Could it be that God intended the place of Christ's crucifixion to be forever marked in our minds as a symbol of death to the world? You see, brothers and sisters, to the world? Now remember, I'm saying this to the world, not to those reborn. But to the world, the place of the skull is not a place of majestic, natural, landscape or scenic beauty like say Niagara Falls or the Grand Canyon. Now, I've never personally been there myself, but in doing this, I looked at a lot of pictures and it's pretty much just a hill. One might say it's not even a place of secular prominence or worldly grandeur. That its only prominence and grandeur is that it inspires the carnal human mind, if you're aware of it, is as related to the death of Jesus. But once that worldly human becomes convicted of sin, once he is actually convicted by the Holy Spirit and accepts Jesus with brokenness and repentance, this place of the skull takes on a whole new meaning and beauty. A new life, so to speak. Calvary represents death to the living here, dead on earth. But to the reborn, it symbolizes transition. Death to the old, rebirth to the new. In a savage message I gave some time back, <clears throat> I said that I did not believe in coincidences. I still don't. I don't, you know, I, I don't believe in coincidences. I believe that in everything we do, or in everything that happens, we can find the greater purpose of God's love in it. We just sit back and look for it for what it is. I read a, uh, and I'm going to read it to you in a little while. I read something in our newsletter this week that really impacted me. And it reminded me that do we really truly cherish these moments today? Brothers and sisters, I, I may not be here tomorrow morning. I don't know. I may not be here in a few hours. So do we truly cherish this moment? Something to think about. I cherish the moment I'm looking at Ben and Carol. I'm cherishing this moment right now. I know that'll be gone at some point. So I bring you back to this. Is it any wonder? Is it any mystery that our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, enters this world and leaves this world in a lowly place? Good news is that his majesty and greatness will present itself when he returns. Amen? Amen? Those who are saved, born again, Calvary becomes a symbol of new life, conquering death. So let's answer this question. Why Calvary? Before we answer that, let us understand what Calvary is and what it accomplished. Three things, three simple things in all hand right now. First, Calvary is where the divine love of God met 
and defeated sin, completely revealing his amazing grace to all of mankind. It didn't have to happen. Prophecy music, yeah, but there was a risk. Let's go ahead and open our Bibles to 1 John. 1 John. 1 John, chapter 4. It's 1 John, chapter 4. Verses 7 through 10. 1 John 4, verses 7 through 10. And it reads, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. You're going to see the word love several times repeated in here. Beloved, let us love one another, for the love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God. For God is what? And in this love of God was what? Here's a beautiful word of what God manifested towards us. Now, who could that manifestation of love be? Oh, there it is. That God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through who? And in this love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the appropriation. Oh, there's a big word. I promise you, I practice that too, but appropriation for our sins. That balm. That thing that soothes the pain when you get hurt, when you get burned. Appropriation. That's who Jesus is. That sin that continually burns you. He is that man. I don't mean to put him in a little box here, but just to understand that word. You see, the sinful world now has been introduced to the prophesied Redeemer. That Goel that we were told was going to come and free us. We are now introduced to it. Sinful man came to know the Lamb, the love of God, manifested in the Word incarnate. Manifestation of his love. But was that the end, brothers and sisters? No, not by any stretch of imagination. In order for the sinner to understand the need for redemption, he needed to understand that what? That he was sick to begin with. That he was sick in the first place. And then to understand that that sickness, excuse me, that that sickness, and the only way it was going to end with that sickness was with death. The unredeemed needed to understand the price tag for sin, the consequences of sin, the wages of sin. Romans 6, death is what it says. On Calvary, brothers and sisters, on Calvary, brothers and sisters, we stood in judgment. Our only sentence at this point was the grave. How did Pastor Q call it before he left? I think in one of his last sermons he said, the unbreakable sleep. That, 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 that caught my attention. Now, that's a profound way of looking at it, isn't it? Brothers and sisters, as he promised, a promise of redemption. His will was to defeat sin, to break the unbreakable curse, in order to pave the way for this promised gift of eternity. But how is this to be? Let us not forget, then, that by his stripes we were healed. Yes, God loved us so much that he sent his own begotten son to pay the price of our iniquities. <clears throat> Jesus died on that cross for everyone. Everyone, brothers and sisters. All those people we don't like, yeah, he died for them too. Those people we disagree with politically, socially, religiously, them too. How about those people that hurt us? Not them, huh? Yeah, them too. Yeah. I mean, even those rebellious kids that like rock and roll. Them too. The hymn, How Great They Are, says that on the cross my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. The price of our sins were paid for with a huge ransom. And yet, brothers and sisters, each and every single one of you was purchased. Each and every single one of you. You matter. You absolutely do. Second. Calvary. Calvary is where, hear this out, Satan's desires, the things Satan wants. 
Calvary is where Satan's desires were defeated and God's will prevailed. Let's go ahead and turn to Genesis, first book, Genesis, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Genesis 3.15, and it says, I will put, or it says, and I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Satan, put on a word, he was warned. Calvary, brothers and sisters, fulfilled that warning. Was God done? Not quite. Just as mankind was reminded of its need for a savior, the heavenly Goel, that which was going to free us from the slavery of death, God reminded Satan why evil was conquered that deadly day. One last Bible verse. Hebrews 2. Hebrews 2. I was debating with Isaac this morning if we were going to put it up there, but I also remember what Pastor said last time. Uh, I guess if we put it up, I'm just going to be making looking at us all the and so let's just let's look it up. Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, chapter 2, verses 14 through 15. 14 through 15. Hebrews 2, 14 through 15. And it reads, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, even as the children have partaken of this flesh and blood that he has offered, he himself likewise shared in the same that through death he, with a capital H, might destroy him with a lowercase h, who had the power of death. That is, who? The devil. the devil. And release those who through, oh, here's that word, I said it earlier, fear. Fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Brothers and sisters, he who held us ransom, he who held us bondage, he who manifests death was to be destroyed Freeing those who accept Christ as Lord and Savior, not just from death, but also from the what? The fear of death. Did you ever, I mean, when I read that that time, I said, oh my goodness, I had actually kind of lost that part. See, brothers and sisters, our salvation, your salvation, is not simply, I mean, it includes this, it's a big part of it, but it's not simply freedom from death itself, it's also freedom from the fear of death. That way, as you live this life, Accordingly, you are fear, you are freed from the fear and the anxieties and the and and, and the worries and those things that that, that that rob us of this comfort, from the comfort of the knowledge of what his promise was to us once you surrender to Jesus. So it's not just salvation from death, salvation from the fear of death. That means live what right now, this moment. What does that mean? You were not born with the spirit of fear. For the lamb, the dear lamb of God, left his glory above to bear it to dark Calvary. We sung that earlier this morning. Finally, brothers and sisters, Calvary. Calvary is the place where, guess what? Your future is determined. It's where you must actually answer one simple question. Do you accept Calvary as fact? And with it, the gift of salvation? Or do you reject it? That's kind of two questions, but you get my point. Luke chapters 23 and 24, it tells us the story of Calvary. It's the story of death and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It reveals to us the character and purpose of our Heavenly Father for all of mankind. You see, brothers and sisters, when you read through it, there are multitudes of people there that day. From the moment he picked it up and he carried it all the way up to Calvary, there was multitudes of people there that day. His followers were there, his family, his friends, loved ones were there. Guess what? Those who hated him, they were also there. Those who feared his messages, the hypocrites, the cowardly, they were all there. The brave were there. The self-righteous and the unrighteous, them too. The repentant and the unrepentant. They were all there. Guess what? Even just the curious. They were there too. You can safely say that all of mankind was represented there that day. But, you know, I'm not telling you something that you don't already know. What I want to do is remind you of something. There were also two men there on their crosses. Crosses that they deserved. 
They were beside Jesus. They were representing the only two types of human beings in this world. Both were criminals. Yet one died lost and the other was saved. Each representing one of two choices. Black and white, again, no gray areas here. Both are criminals. We all are criminals if you look at it. But some believe and are found. Others reject and die lost. The question is, which side of the cross are you on? As a redeemed sinner, when you are freed from the slavery of death, you are not promised troubled life, brothers and sisters, a life absent shadowy valleys or unstable mountains. No, no. As a matter of fact, you are to expect the opposite. For if the world, I remind you what John tells us, for if the world despises you, remember, it despised him first. You, brothers and sisters, you will also be called upon to take up your own cross, so that with your burden you are to place your trust fully in the Christ that stands in you. As you stand on the Calvary of your own lives, which cross have you chosen? The cross that burns you enough to admonish Christ as he hangs for your sins, blaming and cursing him for all of your sorrows and all of the pains and all of the things that just don't go right in your life. Daring him to save you and himself in order to prove his character, in order to prove his worth. You're going to choose that cross? Have you chosen the cross that guides you to simply, just simply ask Jesus to remember you? He enters his kingdom. <laughs> but let us never forget Jesus was there too our God was there sustenance was there the hope was there how blessed are we who share his promise I would like to end here by saying this now brothers and sisters it's not my intention and I don't normally do this and it, I promise you it's not my intention to insult other belief systems or other religions in order to validate my belief system or religion I'm simply going to give you a couple of facts that if you were to ask the followers of these faiths, they would gladly and readily admit to. So, not a criticism, just simple facts. Muhammad, he lived and died. He's in the grave. Siddhartha Gautama, I hope I pronounced that correctly, would later become Buddha. He lived and died as in the grave. Mahatma Gandhi, modern day. He lived and died and is in the grave. There are inspired prophets and prophetesses that we listen to, study, and what have you. Guess what? All asleep in their graves. They have all turned to dust. Brothers and sisters, did you know that there are some gods that are mental creations of their followers? Vishnu, Shiva, Rudra, Brahma, Gawan. The creation giving life to the creator. None of these gods, and again, not a critique, just a simple fact. None of these gods experienced a Calvary. Not one. They all asleep. They're all asleep in their graves. Not one. None. Except for Jesus. His cross on Calvary brought us life and bridged us to the eternity that God offers. Amen. Brothers and sisters, we must all meet God in a place called Calvary by faith. Do you believe Jesus did die there for you? If not, if not, it's not too late. You're still drawing breath. You still draw breath as we speak. If you're afraid, if you're hurt, wounded, wondering, is this for you? Come and ask him. Come and ask any brother here that has accepted. Brothers and sisters, I also beg of you, if you are approached by somebody who is this fragile, or who is wondering, or who is needing of this message, I beg of you, take them in. Don't use it as an opportunity to show them how much we know, or how much we can tell them about. No. Love on them, listen, guide them. Teach them with love what God's message was. Now if you do, if you do accept him, I encourage you with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, with all of your strength, love the Lord your God. Choose to cling to that old rugged cross so that one day you can exchange it for a crown. May God bless you and your families and may he forever be your cross.
Before I end, I told you I wanted to read to you something that kind of influenced what I was going to say today. I was all over the place for the past, uh, past few weeks. And I read this part in the newsletter. And it says, my dearest Northeast ch church family, by the way, I, I'm trying not to break up because I, I read the entire article. I, I, I'm, I ask you, you ought to read it as well. But I'm going I'm to read this last paragraph. It says, My dearest Northeast Church family, I love you for who you are and for all you have done for my family and me. You have blessed us by your actions, and I'm so grateful for every one of you. I will never be able to repay you for all your kindness and love. Perhaps I'll be able to pay it forward someday. You were all there on my darkest days and helped me get up, back up on my feet. With all of my heart, I say thank you. With deepest appreciation and love, Lori Hall. You see, life can change in an instant, just a moment. When I was younger, I always believed I had it tomorrow. <laughs> but again, I said this, and I'll say it again, he was patient with Brothers and sisters, do you truly appreciate this moment? I love each and every single one of you, and I ask of you one last time, choose to cling to that old rugged cross. Turn in your hymnals to hymn number 86, How Great Thou Art. 